I am very happy to welcome Representative Ricky Hurtado. He is a first term legislator in the North Carolina General Assembly, and he is also an educator and the founder of Latinx Ed. Welcome, Representative Hurtado. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hey, Lynn, good morning, and good morning, everyone here at the conference. It's really an honor to, to be with you all this morning. So I know you're a former educator, um, and I'd love to ask you, of course, our, our, as you know, the conference today is about privatization efforts in North Carolina and pushing back on these privatization and efforts and strengthening our public schools and protecting our public schools. Can you please tell me what you see or how educators are impacted by privatization in the classroom? What, what, how do they see the, and feel these impacts? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question. Uh, we see it every day when we talk to frustrated educators. And so in our role with Latinx said, we do, um, stay in conversation with, with educators, with teachers across the state. And I think first and foremost, they see the impact that privatizing our schools is having on the impact they can have on their own students. And so, you know, this has been repeated already many times on the conference, but what does it mean for actions that be, are being taken at the state level where I am currently at the House of Representatives at the General Assembly? What does it mean for us to slowly but surely through death of a thousand cuts, continue to siphon off public dollars, taxpayer money from our public institutions into private sources like school vouchers. Uh, teachers, educators understand what's happening and they understand the direct correlation between not having enough resources to support an increasingly diverse classroom uh, and the impact that, uh, that it's having on their classrooms. And so for me, it's frustration that I hear every day. I just had a um, a phone conversation two days ago with a teacher who's just frustrated with the state of things and was telling me, why can't we get any support? We scream, we yell, we follow the rules, we do everything that is asked of us and more, especially during COVID, and to continue seeing our livelihoods as a teacher, but also the support we receive as a school not be prioritized even in the midst of a pandemic is beyond frustrating. And that's what makes me really concerned that this continued impact of privatization will lead to even further um, lack of retention of educators and, and equality that we need to make sure that we're supporting uh, first generation students in particular in our public schools. It, it has been, the pandemic has just ex exacerbated so many of our challenges, right? And I'm, I've no doubt, I can't even imagine how teachers are feeling right now. We, we've heard a lot of that feedback as well. So I don't know if you heard my portion of um, the death by a thousand cuts, you just referenced it a second ago, but I covered the A through F school letter grades that North Carolina does. And I described our formula as the worst in the country mm. um, of any state that uses A through F letter grades for schools, school letter grades. Can you tell us about, do you have any real world examples maybe in your district about how those grades are harmful? Yeah, I, I was just having this conversation actually and it led to a number of other conversations in the General Assembly around my own frustration with this A through F performance grading. You see it in how people are making choices and where they live and what schools they support. And so here in town, so I'm District 63, I'm, I'm the representative in Alamance County, and we have two high schools in, 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 in one of our towns here. And, you know, as we all know in our communities, high schools and, and schools in general carry a reputation, and it's usually rooted in the makeup of the students and those families that, that go to those schools, right? And so there's two schools who have fairly similar outcomes, um, but on the, on the performance side of stuff, their grade letters differ. Uh, but when you compare the growth of those schools, for the last seven years, the school that has the lesser reputation of the two uh, has showed consistent growth or have met expectations for the last seven years. And when you go there, they're doing some really innovative things to make sure that their students are receiving the best type of support that they can imagine. As you can imagine, one school is, is minority majority, uh, while the other school is, is, is not quite there yet. And so you, you sort of think about how that impacts people's choices and perception as they're shopping around for perhaps a where they might live and, and, and where they may go to school um, or where they live and what neighborhoods and support, you know, what school. 
people have told me, right, that one of the first things they do is, is look up the school letter grade to see what the, the state of their local school is. And knowing that that school letter grade does not reflect truly what's happening in those four walls of that school building is really frustrating because no matter how much I plea and so, so much I try to provide a more nuanced perspective as to what actually goes into that formula and understanding the, the 2080 breakdown, that, that doesn't quite register when you're making as big of a decision as to where am I gonna put down a 200 or $300,000 investment to purchase a, a home right if you're in that position to do so and so you've, you've seen a, how on a micro perspective here in Alamance County people are making decisions on where they do want to live and don't want to live and that's frustrating because we know that that's not that doesn't reflect um, the progress that's made every day at these schools and the effort that's being put in not just by our students but by our teachers as well absolutely so as a reminder to our attendees um, as you referenced, that formula is 80% test score and 20% growth. And to your point, there's, there has been efforts to, because that growth is so important, um, it is not weighted properly or adequately in our view. I would love for you to tell us about your work um, on Leandro compliance. And if you've if I could put you on the spot to tell our attendees just a little bit about Leandro. Um, we've done whole presentations just on that court case, and I know a lot of our attendees are very familiar with it, but just in case someone is not, do you mind um, starting with that and then telling us about your work? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I certainly want to pay ode to the champions and advocates who have been working on Leandro for far longer than I have. I'm certainly, in the grand scheme of things, a newer voice and newer player in this conversation. Leandro, for folks who aren't as familiar with it, is essentially uh, two decades, right? 25 years plus uh, old battle around how do we provide a sound basic, basic education to every child in North Carolina? And is North Carolina as a state meeting their constitutional duty to do that? And so we are obligated as a state to make sure that we are providing that, that high quality education to every child. And in the beginning of this battle, we were seeing that in a number of rural low wealth communities, we were not doing that. Um, and to this day, we are still not doing that. And so this has been a battle in our courts for, for, for multiple decades now. And we've reached a point where there were questions years ago around okay, you say we're not providing a sound basic education to every child. Well, how do you even begin to tackle this challenge, right? Like, what does that mean? Like, is there a plan on how we move forward? And so there was a, a third party firm that was brought in to create a plan. Well, what does this look like, right? How do we provide a sound basic education to every child? And so that is where the Leander report came from, right? Which created seven different priority areas that we can invest in uh, in order to make sure that we're providing the so-called sound basic education for every child, which included providing a high quality educator in every classroom, uh, doing the same for principals in every school, thinking about access to early, early childhood education, thinking about our, how our systems connect to make sure we're reaching our post-secondary goals as a state, thinking about equitable funding between urban and rural districts, uh, and also a number of um, efforts in thinking about, well, how do we assess progress on, on, on a number of these uh, uh, priority areas. I think I'm forgetting one or two there, but you get the big picture around what it means, uh, what, what we mean when we talk about Leandro. Uh, it's, Leandro is a much shorter way of talking about this big picture perspective on, on what does creating um, an equitable school system look like for, for us. In your view, how can we in North Carolina offer choice to parents, which I do think is valuable, but within one unified, publicly funded public education system? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think what the way you framed it is incredibly important, right? Uh, none of us are anti-choice. Choice is important in terms of the, the decisions that parents make in terms of making sure their children is receiving the best education that fits their needs, right? Uh, and so I completely agree with you on that front, right? It, it, this is not a conversation around stifling choice. It is more a conversation around uh, equitable opportunity for everyone and making sure that our public schools are in a position to do that. And so part of my frustration in the General Assembly right now is seeing how we are 
creating an unequal playing field for public schools when we create a different set of rules for, for example, charter schools as than we do for public schools. And there always seems to be loopholes for charter schools and, and every piece of legislation. And so I, I think that by making sure that the rules, many of the rules that dictate um, how public schools operate also apply to charter schools is an incredibly important piece of this around creating that equal playing field. I think the other part is is Leandro too. I, I, I got to go back to Leandro because it's like without fully funding our public schools, if we're not meeting our constitutional duty to provide this education to every child, it's an impossible endeavor to make sure that parents have truly that choice to provide that quality education for their children in those public schools. And so we have to be meeting, this is the floor, this isn't even the ceiling that we're talking about. We're talking about meeting the floor for public education. And we have to get there in order for us to to truly begin talking about what choice looks like in a unified public school system. Uh, And the last point I'll make here on this topic is I work mainly on the on the upper side of this K through 12 continuum with high schools and, and colleges and thinking about post-secondary opportunity. And there's a number of models that show us how students can create their own advent- adventure, if you let me allow that phrase, in pursuing post-secondary education within the same public school system. And so we see students go through uh, dual language and dual enrollment programs. We see students go to early colleges. There's a lot of different opportunities for students to stay within the same public school system, but perhaps have a choice as to how they pursue their future. And I think by making sure that our students have those support systems within the school, within the public school system, allow us for parents to explore what's the best fit for their child, but not necessarily go down a pathway where we're siphoning siphoning off supports and resources for our children from the school system for them to have that equitable opportunity. So those are a few of my thoughts there, but I know we could have a whole conference on on creating choice for parents here in, in our public school system. At the end of the day, this work should be not about political parties, but our children. And so whatever advances the outcomes for our children and make sure that we all have an equal opportunity to, to really thrive as North Carolinians, I think we should explore them, right? And so I'm certainly not closed-minded when it comes to innovation and what it looks like for parents to have choice in our communities. We want all those things. Um, as some background for me, I didn't get this in the beginning, but I'm the son of immigrants and my parents fled El Salvador in Central America in the in the 80s. Um, and all of those sacrifices paid off in us being able to live our version of the American dream in rural North Carolina. And so despite the challenges that we faced and you know what the roadblocks that I had becoming a first generation college student at Carolina and then Princeton, uh, we're eternally grateful for the opportunities we did have in our public schools and the type of community support that we had in a place like Sanford. That's where I grew up in Lee County. So shout out to any Lee County educators out there if they're there. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, I am most interested in thinking about how we improve educational outcomes for our children, no matter what that looks like, right? But unfortunately, in this current debate, we see that the current solutions that are being proposed are not working. And we're seeing our schools being segregated to levels we had not seen since, you know, before integration uh, and a number of other things. And so we have to acknowledge when things aren't working either, uh, despite as good of an idea that it looked like in theory. And so continue to fight for our public schools, which in my opinion are the cornerstone of not just our workforce system, but our democracy. And so without a strong public school system, uh, I think a lot of the, the rest of our society begins to crumble as well. Thank you again, that's perfect. Cornerstone of education is a cornerstone of our democracy is one of our taglines. Um, it's all over our website and so. I didn't even know that Lynn, so I'm over here. <laughs> we, we, are, we are kindred spirits, so. Uh, Representative Hurtado, thank you again.